Hey guys, it's Sean here with a quick announcement. We're going to be dropping episodes on Thursday from now on instead of on Tuesday. Works a little bit better with Carrie's schedule and mine, and hopefully it's going to give you something to look forward to in the second half of your work week. So uh, give us a listen every Thursday, right here, same time, same, mm, different time, same place. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. And uh, this is the show where we go into the unexplained, the unbelievable, the spooky, the bizarre, uh, and we hopefully try to find an answer, or at least maybe get more comfortable with not having any. How you doing, Caroline? Huh. <sighs> well, it is a week out from Election Day right now, and... um. I'm relaxed. <laughs> uh, much more relaxed than we have been, yeah. Uh, you know, the tensions are still high, but it seems like things are going in a good direction. So uh, I'm just letting things take their course right now. But I'm feeling a lot better than I did a week ago. I will say that. Mm -hmm. Something tells me there might be some conspiracy uh, news to get into when all the dust settles. Oh, it's there, baby. It is out there and ready to go. All right. I'm excited we have uh, Caroline tracking that for us. Against my will. This week, however, we're going to get into uh, what has been called one of Australia's greatest unexplained mysteries. This is the case of the Somerton Man, also known as the Tamam Should case, uh, for reasons that we'll get into later. Well, I really think you Tamam Should... Get into it. Oh, boy. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this case all revolves around a single dead body that was found um, on a beach in Australia in 1948, unidentified to this day, and the cause of death undetermined. Not drowning. Not drowning, no. Wow. Okay. And it's interesting. I work in the local news. I work for a local news outlet, and we... If there's just a mysterious body that shows up and then and then no other real story comes from it, um, usually we don't even report that kind of thing. You know what I mean? So what? Uh, what is it? Yeah, sure. Uh, you find a, an old person in a park or something. Uh, well, that's just sad. But I mean, what if just a, a random body washed up on the beach? They'd not be interested in it. Uh, we would talk about it for like a day and then we would probably stop talking about it. But it, probably it would come back as a drowning, right? Probably. Yeah. So the particulars of the case would have to be pretty interesting in order to make this one of Australia's uh, greatest unexplained mysteries. Of course. And Australia, we know, was the uh, original home of all of the criminals in England that they didn't send to their deaths. They just sent them to Australia instead. So uh, it's got a very crime-heavy history, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Transportment, they called it. Yeah. I mean... It, it's got a legacy for sure. And for this to stick out is uh, kind of shocking. So I'm interested to hear more about this guy. Okay. Well, this story starts on 6.30 a.m. on December 1st, 1948. Okay. And that is when some walker, some w strollers on the beach found an un unidentified uh, man mm -hmm. lying in the sand on uh, Somerton Beach near Glen Elg, Australia. Did it look like he had just washed up or was he kind of... Higher up on the beach. Higher up. His head was resting against the seawall, actually. Oh, okay. He was lying in the sand. This is right across from the crippled children's home of Glen Elg. Oof. Uh, he's Party lying... central, I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a fun time out there. And all the crippled children, I'm sure, had a nice time looking at this uh, corpse on the beach. Oy. So he was lying on the sand, his head uh, against the seawall, kind of like it was resting uh, for a nap. In fact, his legs were out and his feet were crossed. And there was an unlit cigarette uh, on his collar, as if it had kind of dangled out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, in his pockets, and this is interesting, there was an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henry Beach, Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bus ticket local to Glen Elg, um, unclear whether it had been used or not. There was an aluminum comb that had been manufactured in the United States and wouldn't have been available in Australia. Mm-hmm. There was a half-empty pack of juicy fruit gum, 
there was a pack of Army Club cigarettes, but the cigarettes inside were from a different brand. They were Kensitas. Mm. Interesting. Don't know why you would do that. There was a packet of Bryant and May matches, one quarter full. Um, and he was wearing a white shirt, a red, white, and blue tie, brown pants, and a brown sweater, and uh, what they called a fashionable jacket of American tailoring. Hmm. However, all the clothing labels had been removed from every piece of clothing he was wearing, uh, and the man didn't have a hat or a wallet, both of which were very strange in 1948. He was clean-shaven, and there was no identification anywhere on him. Sometimes, when I when I hear stories like this, sometimes I think, well, if I was just in a random place and I didn't have any sort of identification, I feel like there would be things in my purse that people would read real heavy into years and years later. Like, what does the juicy fruit gum mean? What does the cigarettes in the wrong box mean? I feel like there's probably normal explanations for a lot of those things. Maybe he condensed, you know, one of his boxes of cigarettes into another one. Maybe that box was damaged and he had one that was still good. And when it comes to the labels, I am a prissy little baby. And so if there's ever an itchy label on like my t-shirts or anything like that, I always snip them off. So maybe it was a situation like that. Or maybe it was a conspiracy to never reveal his identity you think this man uh, just had like very sensitive skin on the back of his neck listen i do someone would find my body and see a bunch of snipped off labels and be like she didn't want anyone to know who she was and really it's just um i don't like itchy feelings yeah what would be the things in your purse that we'd be reading into 20 30 50 years after the fact uh Oh, God. Oh, there was only one Hocus Pocus character missing from her keychain. What does that mean? I mean, tell I have us? several things on my keychain, so you're already got, you got that to interpret. I have a mini set of tarot cards, also a keychain. I have um, a crystal. I have a figish um, charm that my Nana gave me, which is kind of a uh, evil eye warding off sign in Portugal, where my family's from. So people would assume you were a witch. Yeah, I have like a shell that I carry around. I have regular stuff, you know, like money and tissues and pads and things like that. But I do have weird things in there that are probably not the usual. There was no marks on this man and no uh, apparent cause of death around him. Uh, But some witnesses uh, came forward and said they had seen him lying there the night before in exactly the same position. Uh, One couple saw him around 7 p.m. And they say they were pretty sure he uh, extended his right arm uh, slowly in front of him and then dropped it limply on the sand again. Uh, They didn't see a move other than that. Maybe he was having a stroke or a heart attack. Another couple, that was around 7 p.m. Another couple uh, saw him... Sort of watched him, it sounds like, between 7.30 and 8. Uh, they knew the time because in between the streetlights had come on. And uh, they said he didn't move an, a muscle the whole time they were watching. And they thought that was strange because there were mosquitoes out. He's dead, you guys. Well, they, <laughs> It's like Shaun of the Dead. He's so drunk. They did. They, they said they figured he must have been drunk uh, and passed out. And they were just, ah, well, he's having fun. They hmm. moved along. Boy. Not great. I mean, the wallet thing could just be someone stole his wallet, Mm -hmm. either knowing he was dead or just thinking he was drunk. And they stole all of the clothing labels as well? That I don't know. He could not like itchy things like me. Um, But since it was kind of more of a common thing back in the day to label all of your clothing because you had like much fewer pieces of clothing. And so you're like, this is my jacket, my one jacket. This is Carrie's jacket. I'm going to write my name in it. Kind of like going to sleepaway camp. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There was one other witness who claimed that uh, he was with three other guys and they had all seen a man uh, carrying another man on his shoulders on Somerton Beach uh, the night before, November 31st. Carrie, like... Like playing chicken with him? Like what what do you mean carrying him on his shoulders? I meant November thirtieth, by the way. There is no November thirty first. No. Carrying him over, I, I assume like a fireman carry. Oh, okay. Because I was kind of imagining him sitting on the shoulders. <laughs> Just like weekend. Like at a Bernie's. chicken fight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, that's weird. Okay. They're having fun. Um, so there weren't gonna be any answers until a um 
autopsy was conducted, and they brought in the big guns. They brought in John Burton Cleland, who, uh, as, as Australian pathologists go, he's the tops. He's the most famous one. He's got three names. He seems good to me. Uh, now, Cleland uh, described the um, victim as having a Britisher appearance. Hey, look like a British. I know that's Cockney. I'm going to try to find an Australian accent and I'm going to only offend people if we happen to have listeners down there. Yeah. He also said the man was, uh, (laughs) appeared to be between 40 and 45 years old, but he was in top physical condition. And in fact, he talked a lot about his calves specifically. He said this guy's upper calves were, um, unusually developed, um, like either a ballet dancer Because they're on point, you know, so much. Mm -hmm. Either a ballet dancer or someone who wears a lot of very high heels. What if he was just like a runner or something? Could have been, Because they're usually skinny, but they have defined muscles. Yeah, but this is specifically (laughs) the defined upper calf muscle. Like, he's up on tiptoes a lot. (laughs) He's not RuPaul. What do you mean? I don't know. They just think he was wearing heels a lot. Yeah, or he was a ballet dancer. Or Peeping Tom, I guess those would be on tiptoes, too. <laughs> yes, he was just a habitual peeper. <laughs> but very short, so he really had to stretch to get into those windows. Uh, he was actually five foot eleven. thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you very much. He had gray eyes and uh, what was described as fair to ginger hair, so I guess that's like a cherry, what do you call it, strawberry blonde? Yeah. Uh, but he was slightly gray around the temples, Reed Richards style. Um Clellan said his hands and nails showed no sign of manual labor, which seems um, like a little shade to throw on a dead guy. I mean, you know, leave, leave him alone. I'm sure he worked hard for his money. It's like them calling the, the lady a robust woman in the spontaneous combustion case. Uh, yeah. Yes. Let's not shade. Can we stop body shaming the dead, please? Absolutely. I, I never would and I never will. But now, this guy sounds kind of hot. Well, his uh, he does sound kind of hot, and uh, you can see a picture. Actually, his death, you can see his death picture. Well, I'm not going to be like, that corpse is real hot. To me, he looks a little like young Harvey Keitel in the in the corpse picture. Oh, okay. So I'm just, I'm going to like put that overlay onto the rest of this story. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the uh, Clellan said this man's heart was normal in every way. Nothing had gone wrong with his heart. Uh, but his spleen was three times the normal size. It's kind of a, like a bad Grinch. His <laughs> spleen grew three sizes that Ugh. day. Um, and his throat and stomach were deeply congested. Okay, so he at least had a cold. But what what causes the spleen thing? What kind of medical maladies? Well, uh, Cleland said, um, and I'll, I'll quote here. I am quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. I've never never seen your eyebrows look pointier than they just did. (laughs) They like ascended into your hat line and I I could not see them again. I was just trying to really embody Cleland. (laughs) And the accent. It was also a little Southern too. What score are we giving me on the accent? Oof. On, a, on being an Australian accent or being Cockney? <laughs> no. He's Australian. Austra- um, This is me, not an Australian, giving you this. I would say maybe a five. I've heard worse. We're grading out of six? Ten. Oh. <laughs> yes. Classic out of six grade. All right. Well, I heard a five out of six, so that's pretty good. <laughs> um, the, the man's last meal was a uh, pasty. They had three or four hours before his death is like, a, you know, like a meat pie, like the bland British version of a Jamaican beef patty. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a pasty. Um, maybe it's a pasty, actually, because a pasty goes on your nipple. I'm a pasty. I'm a pasty. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit of Lee Harvey Oswald humor for all of you. Mm-hmm. Carrie knows no other kind of humor. <laughs> it's literally the only one I know. So those were the facts from the autopsy. Um, Cleland felt that um, it was a poisoning, but uh, there weren't really any other conclusions to draw. And obviously there wasn't much else in the way of testing they could do for poison back in the day. 1948. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. So what's the big question mark here? 
because I'm sure there's plenty of like unidentified bodies all around for years and years and years. What makes this guy so special and so mysterious besides his beautiful calves? Well, this would have faded into obscurity, calves and all, uh, <laughs> if not for a little bit more evidence coming into the case. And that came January 14th, 1949. Uh, when staff at the Adelaide Railway Station found a brown suitcase with the label uh, r- removed from the inside. What's this, like, three weeks later, at mm-hmm. least? It had been checked into their coat room uh, sometime after 11 a.m. on November 30th. This is a pre-9-11 world, man, leaving suitcases in a coat yeah. room for weeks and An weeks. An unattended bag for almost a month. Mm, absolutely well, Two not. weeks, I guess. In that suitcase... Uh, Investigators found a red checkered dressing gown. Very old timey. Male? Yeah, like a yeah, a nightgown. <laughs> right. I was wondering if it was like a Scrooge situation I, or if yes. it was a lady's dressing no, gown. No, I think it's a Scrooge situation because he had mat- matching red felt slippers. Oh. Size seven. Men's just, seven. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a small, small. It's a dainty foot. It's small. He had four pairs of underpants, a set of pajamas, uh, some shaving items. Some light brown trousers that had sand in the cuffs. Okay, the guy likes a beach, clearly. An electrician's screwdriver, um, a uh, stenciling brush. It's a little more non-standard. Mm-hmm. There was a tie with the, the name T. Keen stitched onto it. Mm-hmm. There was also the name Keen on a laundry bag. Uh, it's K-E-A-N-E. And then uh, K-E-A-N, without the E, was on... Uh, what I've seen referred to in several sources as a singlet. I don't know if that means a, like a wrestling singlet, but some kind of a bathing gu- suit. Maybe it was a bathing suit. 1948. Maybe it's like a bathing costume. Seems like this guy loved a beach. Loved a beach. So was, okay. So his name's Keen. We'll we'll get back to that. Oh boy. Um, investigators found it interesting that he had no spare socks, and n- he likes to feel the sand between his toes. I'm telling you. He was wearing shoes and socks though. Listen, when we go away, I'm lucky if you bring more than one pair of anything. The man also had pencils and stationery, but there was no uh, correspondence, no letters in the in the suitcase. Yeah, because he had sent them. Now, here's the interesting stuff about the suitcase, Caroline. This man had in this bag Barbour brand, B-A-R-B-O-U-R, uh, thread in the color orange. And on the dead man, um, there was a fob pocket. That's the little like condom pocket in your um, hip, you know, in your jeans. Speak for yourself. I call it a lipstick pocket. Thank or, you very much. Or a much. change pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, th- that little pocket is uh, it was repaired on this man's uh, pants, and it was repaired with uh, orange thread, just like this, same brand. And it was unavailable in Australia. It was a U.S. brand. Well, it also seems like this guy came from outside of the country or from the U.S. I mean, he even had a red, white, and blue tie, Sean. I know. I know. Uh, Their flag is also uh, red, white, and blue. Sure. But these colors don't run. (laughs) Not even to Australia. (laughs) That's true. That's true, Caroline. Um, But this is interesting. He also had a table knife that had been cut down in length and sharpened. into shiv? Into sort of a shiv. And he also had a pair of scissors, the points of which had been sharpened to like almost a razor edge. This is like what I would find in a suitcase in Fallout 4. And there was a small (laughs) square of zinc that fit those two items uh, perfectly. So police thought that was like a little sheath to protect them. Okay. So he's a traveler. Maybe he's making little weapons for himself to travel with. Maybe. Yeah, classic traveling weapons, Caroline. You don't have a travel shiv? <laughs> not even, not after 9-11. Oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you forget? You said you would never forget. No, what happened to the shiv? Oh, I see. <laughs> um, to answer your question from before, authorities checked in with, um, you know, circulated um, amongst the international community and found no T. Keen was missing from any English-speaking country. Okay. Well, maybe he had moved there earlier. I don't know. Or maybe he stole all this stuff. Maybe this was some other dude's suitcase and he just took it. Well, it wasn't uncommon for people to own a lot of secondhand clothing back then Mm because clothes were more expensive. 
And if you weren't like basically a rich person, uh, you probably owned some secondhand stuff that had been someone else's. And name tags were more common back then as well. People would sew their Mm -hmm. name into things because their jacket was valuable. Um, So it's possible you could end up with someone else's name in your coat if you bought it secondhand. uh, But that doesn't explain the uh, laundry bag. Or the two unless, separate clothing items. Unless he bought someone's bag of clothes. Yeah, I guess, maybe. So the police figured this guy had arrived at Adelaide overnight from Melbourne or Sydney or Port Augusta. Um, he had showered and shaved at the baths, at the either at the railroad station or at, at, there was a public pool around the corner uh, that also had a public bath. Um, he bought a 1050 ticket to Henley beach. As I said, uh, on the train, he didn't go for some reason, didn't board that train. He then checked his suitcase and caught a city bus to Glen Elk. Well, could he have been planning to use that ticket later, but then he was dead and couldn't? Well, it seems like it had a time on the ticket for 1050. Oh. So not like nowadays where you can kind of buy a ticket and it lasts for several months and you can use it whenever. True. Huh. And here's the other two weird wrinkles. Uh, the man's the coroner pointed out that the man's shoes were remarkably clean and didn't look like shoes that had been just wandering the beach on Glen Elg all day. Well, maybe he was holding them because he likes to walk on the beach on his feet. And the doctor also pointed out, the coroner also pointed out that the body site had no signs of convulsions or vomiting. And those are the most common uh, reactions you'd expect from almost any kind of poison. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing else to be done. A plaster cast was made of this man's head and shoulders, and his body was buried in the West Terrace Cemetery by the Salvation Army. People had to donate some money so he didn't have a pauper's funeral. They managed to put him in a pine box. Okay. So where does Tamam Should come in? So, around the same time as the autopsy, Mm -hmm. a tiny piece of rolled up paper was found in that fob pocket, the same one that had been repaired with the orange thread. Mm -hmm. And they just missed it before? Mm -hmm. It was very small and rolled up even smaller. Okay. And it was a tiny scrap of uh, paper with just two words printed on it in uh, an ornate font. It said, uh, Tamam Shud, T-A-M-A-M-S-H-U-D. Mm-hmm. Now, that is a uh, Persian word that means ended or finished. So it's, is it kind of the equivalent of the end? In this case, it was being used that way even because uh, this scrap of paper came from a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, mm-hmm. the, uh, which is like a famous book of Persian poetry. I, I assume none of our listeners have been lucky enough to play the, uh, the point and click adventure game Titanic Voyage Out of Time <laughs> from the mid 90s. But um, that like the whole plot centered around a copy of the Rubaiyat. Um, so it's always I, it, that always pricks my ears up. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, the last page of this um, book simply says Tamam should finished the end and police pretty quickly determined that a copy of that book is where it had been ripped out of. They figured out which printing it would have come from as well. Okay. In fact, it wasn't too long. Um, there's actually conflicting um, conflicting reports here. At the time, newspaper reports said the book itself was found a few days after. The book where it was ripped from? Yes. It was found a few days after the uh, coroner report. Okay. Um. But years later, a uh, detective who was working it as a cold case claimed that the book had been found a few days before the body had been found. Okay. Either way, where was this book found and how did they know it was the same book? Uh, well, it, most people agree the book was found in an unlocked car in Glen Elk. Remember, this is still a um, <laughs> like a local police department handling right. things. So, um, did it? Did the guy own it? Or was it just some random other person's car? Uh, that part I can't find. Somebody, uh, someone called in that they had, that they had found the book. They had found it in the in an unlocked car in Glen Elk. <laughs> um, but somebody somebody had left it there. It didn't belong to the owner of the car. Oh, okay. I, my my main question was: Is it the corpse's car? No, that he had driven. Oh well, no, no, because he took the bus. Weird. Okay, so this is someone's car. It's like you leaving your car unlocked and then looking in the back seat, and there's ooh bonus book, a random book that. Okay, weird. And with the last page torn out. 
Now, because it's such a small scrap, I guess there's no way to like super duper verify that it's the scrap from that book. They chemically tested the paper, actually. It oh, is. Okay. Well, even weirder. It gets weirder. Okay. First things first. Uh, the Rubaiyat's main themes, I should point out, are about living life to the fullest and not leaving any regrets behind. Uh, so some have pointed to that as evidence that this man was committing suicide. Mm-hmm. Although I'll point out that it, it, you know, if that's a suicide note, you know, maybe you make it a little easier to find. I don't know. <laughs> or understand. Right. Um, but here's the other thing. In the back of the book, remember a page had been ripped out, right? Mm -hmm. But there were indentations, like something had been written. You know how your pencil will mm -hmm. leave indentations behind in the uh, back of the book, in the cover of the book. Okay. And um, I'll show you this line, these lines of text here, Carrie. Um, it just looks like a jumble of letters. You've got a long string of letters, W-R-G-O-A-B-A-B-D. And then underneath, another line, but it's been crossed out. And then there's another longer line of text then an X that's also been struck through. And then another line, um, it's, it's about four lines of uh, gibberish in all. And at the time they brought in code experts, um, the allies in World War II had just made pretty big strides in code breaking, right? So they brought in whatever code experts they could find in the country and, and they couldn't make heads or tails of this. They said it was too short a sample to um, properly decode, decrypt. Weird. Okay. There was also a phone number in the back of the book. And uh, authorities tracked that down to Jessica Ellen Thompson, who lived uh, 400 meters or so from where the body was found. Very nearby. Mm -hmm. Tell she, me about Jessica. Well, Jessica said she didn't know the guy. Okay. She might have been lying. Uh, well, we'll get to we'll get all into just we're going to spend some time with Jessica. Trust me. Um, but she said that in late 1948, someone had tried to visit her and um, had asked a neighbor about her while she was out. And she was like, I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Maybe that's all I know. The detective uh, working the case, Jerry Feltis, uh, he said she was lying. He said he just smelled a lie on her when she said she didn't know this guy. And her daughter actually told 60 Minutes that she believed her mother was lying mm. uh, in 2014. But the daughter had no clue who he was? The daughter then started getting into how she was certain her mother was a spy. Uh, because she spoke Russian. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> okay. But they say when she was shown the plaster cast of this man's head and shoulders, uh, Feltis said she looked like she was going to faint. And she wouldn't look at it. She like saw the plaster cast, her, averted her eyes, and then wouldn't look back <laughs> at it. Um, but she said, no, I don't know who that is. Never seen him before. <laughs> Weird. Okay. I think the lady doth protest too much is what I think. Mm-hmm. And she said, um, oh, the Rubaiyat. I love the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. I used to have a copy of that. But my copy was given to Alf Boxhall, who was an army lieutenant I knew back in the war. She had been a nurse. Okay. Did they check with Alf? Um, she said that they had exchanged a few letters, she and Alf, after the war, but then she got married and lost track of him. And the police never followed up on him? No, they actually did. They found him finally in 1949 in Sydney. Um, he still had his copy of the Rubaiyat. Okay. This is so weird. Yeah. So like I said, in 2014, uh, Jessica Thompson's uh, daughter went on 60 Minutes and said that she thought her mom was a spy. And that this had potentially been a hit on the um, Somerton man. Mm -hmm. You know, executed by her mom or, or aided by her mom or else that they were working together and this was some kind of a failed op. You know, it's not the craziest thing I've ever heard. Uh, Jessica had traveled around a lot. Like I said, she was a nurse. And mm -hmm. after the war, she worked with different international humanitarian organizations. It did quite a bit of globe trotting, um, And she also spoke Russian. So that's what her daughter thought. Honestly, it makes a lot of things kind of fit. I mean, his weird clothing, but the fact that there's no one missing from the U.S. with that name, even if he would be going by that name. Um, they're not going to verify who that is if he's actually a spy. Maybe he's someone that she met. I mean, from her reaction to seeing the cast of his body, I would assume that it was more of a situation of he was some sort of connection or um, mentor or something like that, like a positive connection. And maybe she didn't know that he was 
about to be killed or whatever. And that was a tragic thing to her. But I don't know. I mean, if you think about, there must be tons of spies in the world, in all different countries. And they're always lying to people and being shady and stuff. There has to be some stuff where we could answer it if we just knew this person was a spy. Now, what's interesting, now Jessica Thompson, that was the name she gave to police, but this woman's name at the time was actually Jessica Harkness, or Jesse Harkness. Uh, She was involved with and living with a man named Prosper Thompson, and they were planning on getting married just as soon as Prosper's divorce went through. But she didn't get to all that. She didn't get into all that with the police. Uh, She just said, uh, oh, yep, that's me, Jessica Thompson. Maybe she goes by that name. Maybe she does. That's absolutely true. Or maybe she just wanted to appear married. Well, if she's living with this guy or even has a kid with him or something like that, it's not so good back in the 40s. It's true. Well, she did have a kid with that guy. A kid named Robin Thompson. Yeah. So if they weren't even married and he was still technically married to someone else, it's uh, yeah, you're going to go by Thompson. You don't want people shading you every day right back in, back in that era so that uh, avenue didn't have anything else to give at the time uh police put the picture out there hoping may- maybe someone can identify this guy and you know what by 1953 boy did they have luck over 251 different positive identifications had been made of the somerset man okay none of them were uh creditable after the police took a look at it yeah i figured that yep uh, now, in 2011, that's the next time anything happens in this case. <laughs> okay. An ID card was found in a woman's father's things after he had died and she was cleaning at his house. Uh, the ID card was for an H.C. Reynolds uh, from the U.K. And people who looked at, like experts who looked at this ID, she she said, you know what? This looks like the pictures they're putting out there. Um, people who looked at the ID said the ear shape was a very good match. Uh, and there was a mole on the cheek that also made it a pretty good uh, pretty good match for the Somerset man. That said, there are no records in the Australia, the U.S., or the U.K. of an H.C. Reynolds who was missing around that time. Uh, people did find a, a Horace Charles Ren- Reynolds from Australia, but he died in 1953. Did this woman have any um, suspicions about her father being in secret intelligence or anything like that? No, she didn't say. Because, I mean, it could just be a name he used, right, if it's the same person. But I'm sure a lot of people have similar ears and moles. Yeah. How did this guy end up with his ID card, anyway? Well, maybe. I don't know. He's another guy. I don't know. (laughs) He's sentimental. Whatever. All right. Now let's flip this thing on its ear with Derek Abbott. He's a physicist and an electrical engineer who uh, works with the University of Adelaide. They sent him out with a team in 2009 to do some research on this. Okay. I don't know about a physicist doing research on a cold case, but... Yeah, I know. Seems Uh, random. I I, I mean, he's certainly a smarty pants, um, but seems like different areas of knowledge. He has since dedicated his life to this case in more ways than one. Um, Tenacious, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so he found, his team found... That the upper ear hollow of the Somerton man. Uh, oh, they're obsessed with those ears. Was Well, because the, his upper ear hollow was larger than his lower ear hollow. And that is a trait that only 1% of white people have. So like the, the smaller kind of rounder bottom part of the ear right above the earlobe yep. was... Um, less hollowed out than the upper part. Like the upper part of the... The whole ear was really the, deep. The, the upper ear hollow. So uh, this part oh, okay. here was bigger than the uh, lower ear hollow. Okay. Uh, Weird. And that's, that's true in only 1% of Caucasians, apparently. Okay. So that's one thing. He was also missing both of his lateral incisors due to what appeared to be a genetic defect. Oh. And that's only present in 2% of white people. So you're really narrowing things down. Now, here's a third piece of that puzzle. (laughs) Our friend Jessica Thompson, I mentioned her son, Robin. He has both of those traits. Ah, 
And there is a, that is a one in 10 to 20 million coincidence, according to Abbott's team. Oh, Jessica, what'd you do? Yeah. Who'd you do, I guess? Probably the Somerton man. Oh, no wonder she was so horrified when she saw the plaster cast of his body. And that's where Her we... baby s- daddy. Mm-hmm. And that's where we stand uh, as of right now. That's it? Well, Derek Abbott and his team, and now his wife, because um, Robin's daughter, Rachel married Derek Abbott, the physicist from the University of Adelaide. Oh, shit. This is like Nicolas Cage marrying Lisa Marie Presley. Yes. Like the daughter of his obsession. Exactly. Whoa. And they've been pushing for uh, the Somerton man to be exhumed so that DNA kit testing can be done and compared to um, Robin, who uh, died in 2009. I mean, technically, like, why wouldn't they exhume him aside from cost? He didn't even pay for his own funeral. Well, for years, local officials were saying, if we're going to exhume a body, any body, there has to be, you know, um, compelling reason besides just kind of broad public interest, I believe was the word they used. Ugh. But this na- shit drives me nuts, by the way. Don't you want to solve huge cases? Well, now you've got people who say, hey, we might be family members. You know what I mean? R- mm-hmm. This Rachel thinks she might be a f- Rachel Egan thinks she might be a family member of this uh, uh, corpse. So so she wants to find out. Um. And in October of 2019, Ooh, recent. the Attorney General of South Australia, Vicky Chapman, approved the exhumation of the body. Dig him up. But then 2020 happened, and uh, I don't think anything's moved forward in a lot of different areas. But but this body hasn't been dug up It yet. doesn't have COVID. You could dig up a body during quarantine. So we are right now closer than we ever have been to the Summerton Man's. Oh, um, it's so close, Sean. And I think that puts it into a whole new light, this story. If this uh, Robin Thompson was the Summerton Man's kid. Sean, you really blew my freaking mind with that twist. Holy crap. He, so he travels back to try to, to win back uh, the, this. He, they've been having an affair, right? She cuts it off. Mm-hmm. And he can't live live with it, right? And he uh, poisons himself. That's that's what I think this looks like now. Mm. So no spy. But what if he what if he was just incidentally a spy? And he was a and he so he he was murdered. But then also there's no 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 no. Like what if he was he happened to be a spy that she met while she was touring with the military and such. Yes. But that's just incidental. Like, that has nothing to do with his actual death, but it makes things so much more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> like, she pulled the given the Rubiot uh, trick, you know, it's, it's what she does to all the boys. Um, you think she gave out more than one Rubiot? I think that was her that was her deal. She had, like, a stack of them. She's like, anytime I see a fine guy with nice calves and big ears, they're getting this book of poetry, man. She has a connection to it, too. I, I feel like it's a suicide. She, uh, you know, he knows she loves this book. They've she talked about it. She could have even given it to him. Also, another copy? No, that, the, that, the one that had the ripped out uh, page. Yes. But I mean, separate- It could have been, so okay. She, so she also gave one to Alf Boxall? Yeah, he was another- Fuck boy. Fuck boy. <laughs> He was another one, like, Alf, take this. But then she meets Thomas, question mark. And she's like, ooh, I'm all about this. He's mysterious. Let me give him this poetry. And and Tom's like, I'm into this. Like, she's she's giving me this sexy poetry about YOLO and all that stuff. And she gets pregnant, maybe doesn't know it at the time she travels back to Australia with the military. Sean, I think he was a spy. <laughs> I'm convincing myself. I think he was a spy, but it has nothing to do with how he died. Why do I you think th- it just makes it more complicated. Why do you think he was a spy? Is it just because you want it to be true? A little bit. But I also think it does kind of answer a lot of questions of... The shiv is weird. The shivs and the uh, weird kind of American affectations to his appearance where he wouldn't have been able to get the thread or whatever in Australia... Um, he could have met her while she was traveling, while she was a nurse in the army, the Australian army or whatever. Um, yeah, I think. And then, you know, you can't confirm who he is 
even if you're you're in like a secret intelligence agency in America, because if you confirm who he is, then people might know, oh, I I know who that guy is and he was a spy or something like that. Yeah. And you might ask what a spy was doing in um, Glenelg, Australia. However. Well, he could have just gone there to, to try and win the love of his life back. Well, that's true. But also nearby are both the Radium Hill uranium mine and the Woomera Test Range, which is a military research site. He was Sean. <laughs> I think I solved it, to be honest. I think he was a spy. Mm hmm. But it just genuinely has nothing to do with this. It just makes things complicated. Do you think he was there on assignment? No. 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 He just He was came. 400 feet away from her house. He was trying to come see her. She was like, no, I don't think so. I'm not sure if he even knew about the kid. I just want my kids back. I don't even know if he knew about it. But she was like, I'm sorry. I'm with this guy now. Like, this is my life. What we had was, you know, it was fun. We were reading poetry and doing the the nasty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you do. But, uh, you know, I'm over it. You should be over it, too. And then he's like, you know what? This is how not over it I am. I'm going to die in front of your house. Robin Thompson had been born in July 1947, a year and a half earlier. Mm hmm. So like two years earlier. God, two years earlier, they could have been at, at the tail end of the war. Mm hmm. That could have been when this conception. Happened. And even if the war was over, there were still nurses taking care of, of soldiers. Like they didn't transfer everyone back immediately. Mm hmm. I think we solved it, Sean. I think this is the answer. He could have even been like a soldier or something. This is less fun than being a spy, but like a soldier or something that fell in love with her while she was taking care of him. Oh, you got to write this novel. Okay, so he was a soldier. She's the only one who knew wait, who wait, he was. We're abandoning the spy now? This is just another train of thought. He had a bunch of donated clothes because he was a soldier and he didn't have any clothes with him. Maybe he was a prisoner of war, Sean. <sighs> so he wasn't sadder Thomas sadder. Keen or whatever. He was, you know, Billy... Zane. Zane. He was Billy Zane. And uh, he fell in love with her while she was taking care of him. They, you know, got a little frisky at least once. And he, he couldn't let it go. Are you casting Billy Zane? I think we just de-age Harvey Keitel to 45 for this. Do we Irishman You this thing? made it Billy Zane, okay? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I like that she knows who the guy is because I think that's a weird reaction to have. Maybe if you saw the picture of the body, but I've seen the picture of his body. It's pretty famous and it's not like disturbing or anything. I mean, his eyes are open, but it's, he doesn't really look that dead no he looks like the wolf is gonna come and solve uh jules's problem right um, he looks like carvey Keitel is what i'm saying like, yeah he looks like young carvey Keitel. but um you know he doesn't look messed up so i don't see why even a plaster cast of his face would be disturbing i think the only reason to explain her reaction is because she knew him and she was not happy to see he was dead or didn't know that he was going to be dead. So. It's kind of like a tragic, beautiful film that we're only seeing the last scene of. Mm -hmm. And there's like no context to the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Say, so do you think there's a movie in like you start at the finding of this body and then you go back and you t uh, interpolate the story? Yeah, I, w I think that would be great. And then you find out that this whole time it's been this big mystery, but... She never told anyone she knew the answer because she was ashamed of her part in the mystery. Or it, it, Of course, the movie just ends with uh, Jessica. You know, she's old. She died in uh, 2007, by the way. So this takes place in 2006. Mm -hmm. She's at the beach. Yep. And she's standing at the ocean and she pulls out. She slyly looks around. Bill Paxton didn't see it. Good. <laughs> she pulls out a little copy of the Rubaiyat and then she, oops. <laughs> Throws it throws, into the sea. Throws his dog tags with his real name. <laughs> and then just washes back to shore. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on her, lapping up on her feet. <laughs> I mean, maybe she had to like shack up with Thompson right when she got home. She was pregnant or something like that. That could have contributed to her wanting to kind of 
pretend like she didn't know this guy and you know oh they, they might have also she, the, the thompsons might have claimed they were married before they were because of the baby actually i didn't even think about that oh yeah absolutely i think that happened no matter what but it might not have been his baby so she might not have wanted him to know that that's right intrigue sean so much intrigue Oh my goodness. So so that's it. I think there's a beautiful story hiding here. We just don't have the rest of it. Oh my God. I mean, I really hope that they they dig him up soon so we could at least figure out if they're if he's related to Robin. Mm-hmm. And then I think a lot will be answered from there. I mean Jessica never told her side of the story clearly. <sighs> no matter what, if he was a spy, if he was a soldier, whoever he was, I I am pretty convinced she knew him and knew who he was. Maybe she didn't know his real name or whatever. Maybe she didn't know a ton about him, but I'm convinced that she had met him before. Do you think it was a suicide? Hmm. Huh. I mean, in, in this case, if all of those pieces fit, probably. I think it might be a little weird. <sighs> It's weird to take poison and not have, like, anything that you clearly had the poison in or, like, you know, if you have cyanide capsules or whatever, you don't usually just have, like, a loose cyanide capsule in your pocket. <laughs> maybe maybe he was being really dramatic and had that little scrap of paper uh, wrapped around, like, a poison capsule or something. And he stuck it back in his pocket when he was done. Oh, that's interesting. And how beautiful he unrolls Ugh, it and it says the end underneath. What a dramatic... Old queen. Old queen. <laughs> um, that's like the only thing I can think of, because usually you would carry that in something, you know, or if you take a bunch of pills or whatever. I don't know. Hmm. He was either a spy that was murdered, mm-hmm. or he was possibly a spy, but he killed himself. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, flexible on this. I think it's one of the... <laughs> 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 Hey, well, as James Bond learns time and time again, you know, love can be a spy's uh, greatest weakness and enemy. Well, that's that's a deep shot. He's learned it a couple of times. I don't know if time and time again is. <laughs> that sounds like a James Bond movie, time and time again. <laughs> <laughs> time and time again. Was Michael Bublé doing the song yes. for this one? Michael Bublé. <laughs> and it's just called Time and Time Again. Yeah. I was about to say they only use uh, English artists, but that's not true. Madonna's not from England, is she? No, but she thinks she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, that song was terrible. Was Shirley Bassey from England? No idea. Yeah, I don't know enough. I mean, I would say predominantly. Oh, wasn't um Jack White or Chris Cornell or something? Chris Cornell did yeah. one. You're right. He's not English. But when you take a life, you know what you need. I promise, guys, he does have a good singing voice and usually does very good accents. When you take a life, you know what you need. Oh, so aggressive. Rest in power, sweet prince. Anyway. That is uh, going to do it for the Summerton Man, but uh, we're going to take a break and we'll come back with a new segment. You're here, which means you love podcasts, but are you looking for another kind of entertainment on the go? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to memoirs, news, business, and more. By signing up for a free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash ain't it scary, you'll receive access to thousands of titles with one credit toward any audiobook and two Audible originals, free during your trial and then with subscription each month after. Personally, my favorite Audible title is also my favorite book, It by Stephen King. I went into this audiobook ready to judge because I've loved this novel since I was a kid. But between the stellar production value and the truly breathtaking narration performance by actor Steven Weber, I was 100% all in. If you like this podcast and have a strong stomach, I think you will be too. Not into audiobooks? No problem. With podcasts, theatrical performances, guided meditations, and more, Audible offers something for everyone. So what are you waiting for? 
Get started now. And hey, you'll be helping support the podcast. Visit our link at www.audibletrial.com slash ain't it scary for a free trial. That's www.audibletrial.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y. Audible. Listen more. This week on Lizard People Big World, a flat earther has been arrested for breaking Canadian quarantine rules. Ooh. Conspiracy theorist Mac Parhar traveled to South Carolina last month to attend Flattoberfest. Oh, boy. Yes, it's a real thing. It's a convention dedicated to the belief that the Earth is not round, but actually flat, and some combination of governmental and scientific deceit is determined to keep us believing in a round Earth. Oh, thank God. I thought they were uh, all just gathering to drink uncarbonated beer. (laughs) <laughs> Due to Canadian COVID travel restrictions, Parhar was obligated to self-quarantine for two weeks following his return home from America to British Columbia, but he disregarded the requirement and kept coming and going from his home as he pleased. Parhar even received a ticket for flatting the regulation, but kept ignoring it anyway. As he stated on Sunday, COVID doesn't exist. Oh, that's a that's the, that's another... Uh... I guess I should have seen that Listen, one coming. When you go when you go flat earth, you ain't coming back. You're just gonna go deeper and deeper. <laughs> and deeper. Yeah, if that's a lie, then everything is a lie. Yeah. He was arrested uh the following day, Monday, for three violations of the Canada Quarantine Act, which could net him fines up to a very real three hundred thousand dollars and a possible prison sentence of six months per each charge if convicted. Oh gosh. Parhar, who owns a hot yoga studio, of course he does, lost his business license back in April after repeatedly insisting that the extreme temperatures of his business would be able to conquer the virus, <laughs> which also doesn't exist, apparently. So it doesn't exist, but if it does, he's going to kill it. He's going to kill it. And if I know one thing about viruses that don't exist, <laughs> it's that heat kills them. Yeah. All right, great. Well, good for you, man. Uh, I guess. So enjoy your fines and or jail. Yeah, and his beer's still flat probably too, huh? That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. This has been a production of Longboy Media.
Hey guys, it's Sean here with a quick announcement. We're going to be dropping episodes on Thursday from now on instead of on Tuesday. Works a little bit better with Carrie's schedule and mine, and hopefully it's going to give you something to look forward to in the second half of your work week. So uh, give us a listen every Thursday, right here, same time, same, mm, different time, same place. Enjoy. <laughs>